morning, everyone. As of 9 o'clock this morning, over 29,000 Vermonters, 75 and older, have signed up for their first COVID-19 vaccination. In total, we have already administered over 55,000 doses. This equates to over 44,000 Vermonters who have either received a first dose or second dose of the vaccine. And we've done this without the confusion, shortages, and first come, first serve waiting lines you've seen in other states. In addition, Vermont was the first state in the country to have more people vaccinated than the number of people who contracted the virus. And every day that goes by, we're getting closer and closer to ending the emergency and getting back to normal. I wanna thank Vermonters for their patience while signing up for the vaccine so far. But even though the registration went smoothly for most, we also know there were glitches and areas where we can improve. And you can be assured we're working to make this system work for everyone. But still, we're very encouraged by the fact that so many have already signed up. I wanna thank those who helped their family, friends, and neighbors sign up online, which is by far the fastest way. And to anyone who hasn't signed up yet or hasn't gotten through, don't worry. We have enough time slots available for all Vermonters in this population to get their vaccine. And again, to all those who aren't yet eligible but are eagerly awaiting their turn, I certainly understand their uh, anxiety, their, their frustration, especially when we see headlines from other states where they're advertising uh, they have broader eligibility. But again, just saying more people are eligible doesn't mean they have enough vaccine to meet the demand. Every state is still receiving the same amount of vaccine as a percent of population. Every state is limited by the supply. But what's different in Vermont is instead of overpromising and underdelivering, we're being honest with you, setting realistic expectations based on the supply we actually have, and targeting vaccines to those we know are most likely to die if they get sick. And it's important for Vermonters to know we continue to be among the top states for both our distribution and the rate of vaccinations. But I can assure you, being one of the best isn't good enough. Our goal is to be the best. As I've said, as we move through the age bands or if supply increases, we'll, exp we'll expand eligibility. Next to 70 and up, then 65 and up, and then those with certain severe conditions. The good news is I'm hopeful it won't be long before we move to the next, uh, next age band. And eventually we'll be able to consider other strategic priorities and then open registration to the broader population. Yesterday, I was on a call with the National Governors Association and the new administration. And there was consensus amongst the governors. What we need more than anything else is clarity on production numbers and the timeline for increasing doses. Having that information will make a huge difference as to when and how to scale up our programs. In the meantime, we appreciate your patience and rest assured, we'll get to everyone who wants a vaccine as quickly as the supply allows. And we'll always level with you about what's realistic and why we're setting certain priorities. Now, in a moment, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichak for our weekly modeling report, but I wanted to give you some good news as well. Across the country, we're seeing case growth and hospitalizations decline, which will eventually lead to a reduction in deaths. If we can keep these trends moving in that direction while vaccinating our most vulnerable, we can take significant steps forward in our fight against this virus and begin to move back to more normal activities. So to all Vermonters, as we wait our, our turns for the vaccine, uh, let's continue to do our part to slow the spread. And I know uh, this pandemic fatigue is real, but the better we do now, the more we control the virus. 
and the quicker we'll end this state of emergency. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichat. Thank you, uh, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, a week ago, we reported uh, some early indicators that our national, regional, and local 19 trends uh, were all moving in the right direction. And we are fortunately seeing those trends continue, providing us a clear picture that the U.S. is coming down from its most recent and most deadly COVID-19 peak. As the governor said, this is good news for our country, but it's also good news for our region and our state, as having control of the pandemic nationally makes it easier for us to control the pandemic here at home. For 15 straight days, the national seven-day case average has been decreasing, representing a 33% decrease in cases since the most recent high on January 11th. Further, cases in every region of the country are continuing to fall, as are cases in 48 states, indicating widespread improvement across the country. You will notice that cases are also decreasing more rapidly than at any other time. Although we anticipate this pace will slow, we do anticipate that cases will continue to drop uh, in the weeks ahead. Similarly, we've seen a sustained decrease in hospitalizations across the country, with the number of individuals currently being hospitalized down 18% from its most recent high in January, providing further evidence that the country is coming down from its peak. Again, as the governor indicated, it's important to remember that deaths will remain elevated even as we see decreases in cases and hospitalizations. Uh, and we're seeing that play out here with the national death rate falling just 1% since its most recent high on January 13th. However, with cases and hospitalizations continuing to fall, we do anticipate a steady decrease in deaths over the weeks to come. Looking at our regional data, there is also reason for optimism as we see continued improvement. This week, the Northeast reported just under 160,000 COVID-19 cases, a 14% decrease from last week, and a 24% decrease over the last two weeks. The improved cases and the steady rate of testing has meant that the positivity rate for the region has also come down. Currently, it's at the threshold of the 5% or lower recommended by the World Health Organization. As the regional trends continue to be encouraging, so do Vermont's trends. This week, we recorded 942 cases, about a 200 case reduction from last week, and we are also seeing our seven-day case rate slow down as well. After a period of sustained growth following the holiday periods, we've now seen cases on a seven-day rate decline 26% since its most recent high. And without a major family holiday in the near future, we are optimistic that our trends will continue in this favorable trajectory. Now, not only are Vermont's overall cases declining, but so too are our most high-risk cases. Again, we're paying close attention to those who are 65 years or older who contract the virus, because this is the population that is most likely to be hospitalized and most likely to die if they come in contact and contract the virus. Generally, 16% of our overall cases have come from those who are 65 and older. This week, only 14% of our cases have come from that group. And this is something we anticipate continuing to see as the vaccine continues to be rolled out to the most vulnerable. Within this most vulnerable age group, cases among long-term care residents have seen particular improvement. Although we've already recorded more cases in January than we have in December, we have seen significantly lower deaths this month compared to last. You can see the reason for this is in the far fewer number of cases among residents in long-term care facilities in January as compared to December. As a result, we see the number of deaths in this population have come down considerably this month, which has lowered Vermont's per capita fatality rate once again to the lowest in the country. And while it might be too early to attribute this decline in long-term care cases to vaccinations, this is the type of impact that we expect to see as we continue to vaccinate our most vulnerable population in the weeks and months ahead. 
Looking across Vermont, we see that cases are generally falling in every county except for Bennington County, which has recorded the highest per capita active case count of any county since the start of the pandemic. Some of this is explained by the high number of New York residents that come to Bennington County to be tested. Approximately 21% of all positives since November 1st fall into this category. And when you look at our regional heat map, you can also see that the counties to the west of Bennington are equally high, and they have been for some time. Again, possibly indicating some spillover from those border communities. Although it's important for everyone in Vermont to stay vigilant, it's particularly important for those in Bennington County at the moment. Many of Vermont's colleges are also starting to see students return to campus in the past few weeks. So this week we will start to again report on college cases. Unlike last semester, when colleges restarted during a period of particularly low growth rate uh, in our state, we should all expect to see more cases on campus as the semester begins. As you can see from the chart, last fall, as cases in the community began to increase, so too did cases on campus. And we're seeing that here at the first reported week with 118 college cases initially reported so far during their restart. Turning now to the Vermont forecast over the next six weeks, we do see that the forecast has improved considerably compared to last week. However, cases are expected to still remain elevated through the rest of the month and into February. But as we indicated, the most recent data and the positive signs that we've seen in that most recent data give us all indication that we'll continue to beat this forecast in the weeks ahead. Our hospital projections also are looking favorable as they indicate that we have sufficient resources to treat everyone in Vermont who may need uh, treatment, even if we see our cases increase. And again, I just want to point out that when we measure ourselves against the key metrics across the country, we see that Vermonters and Vermont continues to make a major impact. We continue to be at or near the top of these very important metrics, and again, on a consistent week after week basis. And finally, as the governor mentioned, the pace of vaccine administration is also making Vermont a standout. Uh, the most recent CDC data has Vermont ranked number two in the Northeast and eight nationally in terms of the pace of vaccine administration. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. As many of you know, on Monday we began phase two vaccinations in accordance with our vaccination strategy, strategy to save lives. Vermonters aged 75 and older are now eligible to schedule an appointment to get their uh, va uh, COVID vaccine. Vaccination clinics begin today, and I will have more to say about that in just a moment. As the governor mentioned, as of nine o'clock this morning, more than 29,000 Vermonters in this age group have signed up so far for the vaccines, either online or through the call center. This truly is an impressive number. By and large, the registration process has been a success. M most have registered online, and that continues to be our preference as an easy, streamlined way to get an appointment for those who can use it. But not um, everyone who tried to register online succeeded. As expected in its first day of operation, as the governor mentioned, there were a few glitches in the system. For example, if you entered your email address incorrectly, your verification letter could not be sent. Sometimes, depending on your computer settings, the letter ended up in your spam file. Or the registrant, and in some cases the call takers, um, may, made the appointment for a COVID test rather than a vaccine. When we recognized that, we reached out to those people to schedule their vaccine appointment. And on Monday, as the call center was preparing to start operations at noon, we were challenged in the early morning when a flood of calls were directed to the health department, uh, initially to the wrong number 
which resulted in some frustration for those callers. So we rushed the call center into operations hours early, but many people had to wait or were not able to get through, and we apologize for that. We worked it out over the course of the day and had good results through the, through the call center after that. As you know, <clears throat> the 75-year-old and older age groups is just one of several groups we will be vaccinating over the next few months. After this grouping, which we think will take approximately five weeks with our current allocation, we will begin scheduling people 70 years and older, then 65 years and older, and then those with specific underlying health conditions to put, that put them at higher risk of severe consequences from COVID-19. Again, the reason for starting with the older age groups is that over 70% of COVID-19 deaths have been among uh, 70 uh, Vermonters 75 years or older, and more than 90% among age 65 and older. Given these facts and the limited number of doses that states are receiving from the federal government, we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to take this age-based approach first. Vaccinating Vermonters at the highest risk first also helps us uh, get to the end faster because this is the fastest way to reduce the number of people who have severe illness, and this positions us to start to travel down the road to begin to re, uh, return to normal much earlier than if we reduce the benefits of a limited amount of vaccine by giving it to people who are at very little risk of severe illness, complications, or death. We will be reaching out to a select group of those who have experienced the registration and vaccination process to get their opinions on how we can improve the process for others, since we plan to continue to use these systems for the remainder of the vaccine rollout and hope to be able to ramp it up even faster as more vaccines are available. And for those that have not registered, please, there are still available slots for you. You can go online to the, at the Health Department's website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. That's health, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Or you can call the registration call center at 855-722-7878. Again, I, I said a little bit of this last week, but I think it's worth repeating. When you register, here are some of the things that you need to either register online or by phone. You will be asked your name, your birth date, your address, your phone number, and an email if you have one. You will be asked to verify your residency in Vermont. If you are not 75 years old and a Vermont resident, you should not register. You will be asked to answer a series of health questions that are important to know for the vaccination process. You will be asked insurance information, so please have it handy. But if you do not have insurance or you do not wish to give insurance information, you can still register. Again, it will be helpful to have your uh, card for your primary insurance, but it is not necessary to register. Once you finish answering these questions, you'll be asked us to select a vaccine clinic site. Please select the nearest vaccination site to your home. Once you have selected the site, you should select the date and time from the menu of options available. Once you register online, you will get an automatic verification letter sent to your email. If you register over the phone, we will collect a phone number and email address if you have one so that we can issue you a verification. Please remember to keep your appointment once you make it. Cancellation or no-shows will disrupt the process and could lead to uh, vac vaccines being spoiled. We can only register one person through an appointment at a time online and through the call center. That's because each slot is a series of questions that applies just to one person. So if you have a spouse or a partner and you are both 75 years old or older, you will need to register individually. To do this online, you can 
either create an account for each person or create a single account and add the other person as a spouse slash dependent. If you are making an appointment by phone, you can also make more than one appointment uh, by just telling the uh, call taker that you, you want to make more than one appointment. Now let's turn our attention to what's happening today. Today clinics are opening at 25 locations throughout the state and throughout the week, uh, there'll be other locations that will be available where Vermonters can get vaccinated. I just wanna repeat a few things. Vac vaccinations, like I said, will start um, statewide today, and here's what you can expect once you come to your appointment. It's winter in Vermont, so dress for weather. And please arrive on time for your appointment so you don't have to wait long or keep others waiting. Once you arrive, you will be asked for your name and date of birth. You will be asked to sign a vaccine administration waiver consenting to receive the shot. Then you'll be vaccinated. You will then be asked to stay at the site for about 15 minutes so that you can be monitored for any immediate reaction to the injection. You will also get, uh, you, we will also get you scheduled for your second dose while you are at the clinic so that you can leave with the follow-up appointment in hand. Please note, and this is very important, we cannot accommodate walk-ins. The Health Department's Equity and Community Engagement Team is also working with community partners to reach out to those members of the BIPOC communities uh, to identify those 75 years or older uh, to answer their questions and ensure they are able to access the information and tools to register uh, and, and be vaccinated. And we are separately working through the logistics of reaching out to those who are 75 years and older and are homebound and unable to come to the vaccine clinic. We are collaborating with regional EMS and home health agencies on this, and we'll have more information on our plans real soon. Finally, I wanna thank everyone who has worked so hard to make this community vaccination program available throughout the state. This includes many state employees across multiple departments and agencies, from the Agency of Digital Services to the um, State uh, Emergency Operations Centers to transportation to the people at VT, uh, VDH. This has been a collaborative effort from the state uh, respect, but it's also been a collaborative effort uh, along multiple lines, like our health partners, loved ones, neighbors and friends who are lending a hand to help folks get scheduled and all of Vermont for staying vigilant. As I said last week, Vermont has had the most successful pandemic response in the country. And we've done that by supporting each other and putting the needs of others ahead of our own wants. This is the light at the end of the tunnel and, vacc and vaccinating the most vulnerable first will get us out of this faster. We just need to stick together. I just wanted to give you an update. Um, as we were walking in, I was getting a text um, and uh, this is just in, we're learning about it. Um, it's a situation at Springfield Hospital that um, we wanna be transparent about it, but I don't have all the facts right now. Um, so we are still gathering the facts and I'll tell you what I know and we don't know everything in detail, but we are sending a VT, uh, um, a Vermont Department of Health team to investigate. Um, let me get to the, um, to the text. Um, we believe that 860 doses of Moderna vaccine we're subject to temperature excursions today at Springfield Hospital. That means that the temperature is supposed to be eight degrees and it was nine degrees. Um, so we were storing about 860 doses of vaccine that was supposed to be at eight degrees. It was at nine degrees at Springfield Hospital. Um, a, uh, we, the, the hospital and others have consulted with the manufacturer that is required. It led the manufacturer, they had the final say on this, to require that all doses be wasted to, um, to concerns about viability. 
400 of those doses were for second dose clinics. Uh, VDH is doing a site visit. I don't have all the details. Um, this is unfortunate because we've had minimal, I mean minimal, wasted, wasted doses um, in this state. Again, we're still getting the details. I read you from a text that I just got as we were coming into the uh, auditorium, but out of transparency, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of what we were getting uh, for information. With that said, I'll turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. While it may represent just a moment in time, Vermont once again returned to a case count of less than 100 yesterday, 78 to be precise. It's been a while since we've seen numbers like that. On another day when testing was still at a high level and our percent positivity rate continues to go lower and now is at 2.2%. After a week where, as you just saw on the data slides, the new active cases are trending going lower over a week or two weeks period of time. Please realize that though our progress with vaccination has been quite good, it has not yet been a factor in the trends that I've just talked about. And in fact, our data shows we still have a long road ahead of us. There are 46 people in the hospital today, eight in the ICU, one on a ventilator. Sadly, we lost one more Vermonter to COVID-19, raising the total to 172. Now, preserving lives, preventing more deaths is, as you've heard innumerable times, a core part of our vaccination strategy, and that makes me take even greater note of attitudes that effectively diminish deaths and human toll from COVID-19. Sometimes we have discussed that at these press conferences. So let me just briefly present some information from the latest issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association on that topic. From reputable investigators at Virginia Commonwealth University who look back between March and October of last year to look at the deaths from COVID and compare them to the leading causes of death two years prior to the pandemic. Now, as you all know, there are over 400,000 deaths from COVID in the US, setting records all the time, unfortunately. And the daily death counts have sometimes reached in the 4,000s, exceeding those of 9-11 by over 1,000 a day. Analyses reveal that COVID-19 has become the leading cause of death in the US, even deadlier than heart disease and cancer. We also learn that similar to our Vermont data, the risk of death is highest among our oldest citizens and lowest among our youngest, who unfortunately still die at a higher frequency from the so-called diseases of despair including drug overdoses, suicides, and accidents, much of which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. My final comment on that topic is that the nationwide public health consensus is that many of these deaths could have been prevented with an early and comprehensive national pandemic response plan that incorporated basics of mask mandates, adequate testing, and contact tracing and containment. Returning now back to Vermont, of the 63 outbreaks our epidemiology team is currently following, 23 are in the long-term care facility or senior independent, independent living setting, 27 are in workplaces, and five are in schools. You've seen some of the early college data. Both Norwich University and UVM have had increasing numbers of students returning, and we are seeing cases on day zero and day seven testing. And multiple athletic teams, as you've read in the newspapers, continue to be on pause. 
Conclusions about the student cases from the viewpoint of the school's directors of student health services are that they've observed spread is occurring more rapidly with shorter incubation periods and that students are presenting with more symptomatic illness when compared with the fall. Our hopes are to obtain samples to perform genome sequencing, searching for variant strains in some of these students who may have come from other states. Now keep in mind, this is exactly why we are requiring testing of returning college students to identify, isolate, and quarantine before the semester even begins to allow for a safe start for the schools and the surrounding communities. And we are working with the campuses to educate and strategize regarding preventing on-campus transmission. And just a word this morning on the questions that always continue to come up about the variant strains. As advances in our knowledge as well as speculation is occurring every day. First, the word on the UK variant, almost 400 cases in 24 states. Now it is believed it might be associated with not only more transmission, but with more severe illness. And per the UK findings, which need to continue to be peer reviewed and evaluated, perhaps increased mortality. It is still thought to be susceptible to current vaccines. At the same time, we are hearing some discouraging reports about how the vaccines may be slightly less protective against the variant strains from South Africa and Brazil. Fortunately, these are not prevalent in the United States at this time. What this means for the public is the importance to vigorously follow the prevention guidance to, uh, that we always give about getting and spreading the virus. Now, you've heard Secretary Smith detail our efforts to begin community vaccination clinics today. I just want to add, though it was not without some bumps along the way, this is a tremendously exciting step, and I am so proud of the work all of our teams did to make this happen together. It is truly a great day for public health in Vermont and in this country. As we begin vaccinating thousands of Vermonters who are 75 and older, we know we're protecting those most at risk for severe illness and death from COVID. We're already vaccinating healthcare workers and the long-term care facility residents for just a bit over a month. And we're grateful to our hospitals who've been wonderful partners and shown clear leadership in this effort. We're now transitioning to phase two of vaccination beginning with the Vermonters 75 and older, which I've described in the past as an overlap of phases. We've always envisioned we would overlap phases to use our allocations most efficiently, to vaccinate those who need it the most as quickly as possible. And this is consistent with the advice of the CDC and Vermont's Vaccine Advisory Committee. Last time I spoke, I told you I was very pleased with the percentage of the 1A groups that were agreeing to take the vaccine. Well, current epidemiologic and modeling projections give me yet another reason to be optimistic. In Vermont, so few of us have been infected that we stand the best chance in the country to benefit from the vaccine. We can get ahead of the potential for virus spread by having people vaccinated in numbers that lead to what's called herd immunity. But strict herd immunity is not our only way back to a better, norm, more normal life here in Vermont. We need to continue on our um, current trajectory to protect the most vulnerable by immunizing the most vulnerable. And while we wait, for enough vaccine for everyone, we must keep up the same protocols that will protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities. Remember, masks on faces, six foot spaces, uncrowded places. And if you want to get tested, there are abundant locations around the state where you can go. And it's quick, easy, and free. This pathway of increasing levels of vaccination effective containment and suppression of the virus through testing and contact tracing 
and following all of the usual guidance I just recited can and will be our successful strategy to having our state reopen successfully even ahead of achieving herd immunity. Finally, having just emerged from quarantine, and thank you for the many well wishes and words of support, I want to clarify some questions about when I will get the COVID-19 vaccine. I have said, and the governor has said, we will get the vaccine when we are eligible. Not until then, but we will get the vaccine. I look forward to doing so and to sharing my experience with Vermonters as it is a safe, effective, and critical tool to halting the spread of virus. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. I heard you correctly. Um, did you say that um, after we vaccinate the most vulnerable groups, we turn to um, considering other strategic priorities? I, I guess if you can clarify, what, yeah. what does that mean? What, what we're trying to do, obviously, we've set a path forward, um, our plan uh, to do the age bands. Uh, we want to get uh, to those who are most impacted by death uh, due to the contracting of the virus. So that, uh, as Secretary Smith had said, I think in his remarks, 90% uh, of those over the age of 65 uh, are impacted by death um, in, in those categories. So uh, we want to get to those, and then we want to get to the, uh, uh, some of the severe health conditions next. And then we're going to look at where we go from there. Uh, and uh, there may be strategic um, uh, areas that we want to focus on. We just don't know at this point. But we're going to get through that, those phases first and then uh, reflect on where we go from there. Um, and as Commissioner Pichek said, the data is beginning to, is continuing to look promising. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, at this point, what you would need to see um, to maybe lift some of the restrictions we've seen on, on gatherings, and even if it's just a single household trusted family like we have. Over yeah, we, we have a restart team um, that is constantly monitoring the de data. We meet on a regular basis. Um, so uh, we're seeing some good news. Uh, one day does make a trend, I'm, but I'm encouraged to see, I think 78 today, was that what the number was? That's, that's good, it's trending in the right direction. Uh, the number of deaths has slowed slightly, uh, which is good news as well. We're getting vaccines in arms, that's good news. Um, so I think you can expect uh, we'll be uh, opening up the spigot uh, a little bit more in the coming uh, weeks uh, ahead, uh, but uh, I don't want to, you know, uh, exceed our expectations. I don't want to overpromise, uh, but we we look at this every single day. The faster we can get there, the better off uh, we all are. So, uh, I think you can expect some in the near future. And then just one last follow-up question about your budget recommendation yesterday. Um, you know, number of sweeping proposals, one-time um, proposals, but you know, there has been some concern from the business community. Chamber of Commerce, Grocers Association, and others uh, that are concerned that there's not enough help in there. Um, I'm wondering how, how confident you are that more help will come from Congress, uh, potentially in this next package, and if we can wait that long. Well, again, uh, you know, the budget I proposed yesterday uh, was for the next fiscal year. So I don't think anything that I would propose in that budget would help the business community in this fiscal year. As you recall, in budget adjustment, which would help, I propose $10 million to help businesses. Uh, it's met with, I mentioned in my remarks, it's met with some resistance from the legislature. I don't know if they're going to include it or not. I've asked them to reflect on that uh, so that we can help some of those businesses. But, um, you know, it's a little disappointing to hear from the business groups when I've been uh, an incredible ad advocate for them uh, we poured hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, with some of the CARES Act money and the CRF money that we've uh, received thus far. We'll continue to do everything we can. I think Congress is uh, poised for more action. They were, uh, they were given uh, some opportunities for PPP loans and, and so forth. We had uh, Tom Lozon here a week ago uh, in, in considering some of their options. So. Again, I know how frustrating it is. I, uh, I've talked a lot about, especially in the hospitality sector, how impacted they are, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to help. But the budget address yesterday 
wouldn't help them immediately. Uh, this is for the next fiscal year. Uh, before we go to the next person, I just want to make note that we do have a long queue today, 20, uh, 24 left. Steve? Uh, Governor, the uh, new administration's been in for a couple of weeks now. He's mentioned, the president has mentioned that uh, he's going to have a li liaison between them and the, uh, and the state uh, governors or, or the government as far as uh, COVID goes. Have we seen that yet? And have you been, you know, uh, where are we at supply-wise? Yeah, um, well, there was a National Governance Association meeting yesterday uh, that I was uh, listening in on. Uh, and they committed to having weekly calls of that nature, uh, talking about uh, COVID updates and so forth. Again, giving us, uh, we were very clear about what we need. We need, you know, we don't need them uh, to come in and tell us uh, how to vaccinate. What we need to do is uh, have them come in and tell us, first of all, uh, increase the supply. Uh, second, secondly, uh, tell us uh, when we can expect or the consistent nature of that. To date, we've been going on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, hard to plan when you don't know what you're going to get the following week. Uh, they did commit yesterday uh, to a three-week uh, consistent uh, supply, um, so that's good news. They, they also uh, committed to a 16% increase over those three weeks. That's good news. We don't know for sure what we're going to get beyond that, but we think it's going to be consistent uh, and hopefully upgrading uh, as we move forward. But we just want more transparency about what the production levels are, uh, what we can expect in the future, so that we can plan. And that's been the beauty uh, with, with the uh, strategy that we're using here in Vermont. Um, when we use the banding uh, that we're using, a uh, limited number of people within each band before we move on to the next, uh, we can plan that far ahead. Uh, but if you, uh, if you open it up like other states have uh, to a really broad population, and then you're and then you're going out, uh, you know, five, six months ahead, not knowing what you, what you have for supply coming in, uh, it doesn't allow you to be as nimble as you could be. So I believe our, our strategy, our plan, uh, will get us uh, towards uh, uh, the vast majority of Vermonters getting uh, vaccinated than others, uh, other states. It's just a good plan. Then we can reassess every time we uh, go to a, next, uh, a new phase. Very quickly, the talk of uh, coming out of Washington that uh, they, they would have made inroads with the Canadian government about uh, getting a dialogue going to open up those borders. Um, any response to that? Yeah. Have you heard anything? Well, I haven't heard anything specifically about the borders, but uh, Commissioner Pichek, um and, and myself, we, I, we keep track of that data on a daily basis, watching what's happening in, in Quebec in particular. Uh, because it does impact us just like our it's part of our region uh, so we want to you know we want to get there where the borders open up as quick as possible but we don't want to uh, get there quicker than we can take care of it either um, when they we still see the positivity rate uh, is is escalated uh, from where it was during the summer uh, so we have some concerns they have concerns about what they're seeing in the u.s as well particularly in States uh, that border us, like uh, New York, for instance, their their cases have increased dramatically. So uh, I think we just all want the same thing. We just want to open up the borders as quick as we can when it's safe to do so. Thank you, Kevin. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Rebecca, I had a um, Governor, when talking about the population of eligible Vermonters to receive the vaccine, is the state projecting the number of Vermonters who go down to Florida and places south for the winter? Um, our data shows Vermonters uh, in that population. Um, so if they are Vermonters who go to Florida and are still Vermonters, uh, then uh, they are part of that age band. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, and on that point, not everybody in the eligible group will register for a vaccine. So at what point are you going to move on to the next group to open up registration? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, I don't know what the exact number is. Maybe uh, Secretary Smith can answer that. But uh, obviously, uh, we'll watch the numbers as they come in. Uh, we'll be sure that we can vaccinate all of those with the supply we have. And then we want to move on to the next age band as quick as we possibly can. But, but again, as I said before, if we... If we had an idea how much we're going to get like a month from now and, and beyond, that gives us the opportunity to 
to uh, gauge the, the size of the vaccination plan according to the supply we know is coming in so that we don't uh, overpromise, uh, but we don't undercommit either. We want to make sure that we're, we're have the, uh, all the details that we possibly can in order to give uh, Vermonters what they need. Secretary Smith. Dr. Levine and, and the governor mentioned this. We're not going to wait until every single person in that group is vaccinated. You know, like we did with 1A, we'll start moving on to the next phase once we feel that registrations are starting to taper down and also when we look at the available slots. So we, we don't have a time commitment, you know, a time period on this, but we'll play, pay, uh, play, pay close attention to when those um, vaccination, start, uh, vaccination registrations start to taper off and then start planning for the next phase. Thank you very much. Courtney, Local 22. During press conferences last week, but I'm wondering um, if there's been any developments in reaching older Vermonters, 75 and up, who are homebound and cannot get out of their house to go get the vaccine. Yeah, that's been a concern for us. I'm gonna have uh, Secretary Smith answer that directly, but uh, we are contemplating that uh, to make sure that we can get to them uh, just as quick as we possibly can. And uh, it's part of our strategy. Thank you, Courtney, for the question. We are um, we are moving as rapidly as we can to get line lists of those various individuals through the home health agencies who are homebound. As soon as we have those lists completed, which we're getting pretty near uh, completed, we'll start setting up uh, through home health agencies. And when the home health agencies don't have um, the capability of uh, reaching those people through EMS, uh, to vaccinate those individuals as well. I would say you would start having, we would start having specifics within seven to 10 days from now. Okay, thank you. I'm also wondering just over the past few days, if the call center has um, fielded any calls from people under 75 who may be trying to beat the system, go against the guidelines you guys have put out. Yeah, I have not heard of that instance uh, instance um, from the call center. I've actually heard some um, that are uh, amazed at some of the people that are signing up online, for example, people that are um, over 100 uh, signing up online. But I haven't heard of the instance, any instances that you, uh, you, you spoke about. Okay, thanks very much. Good morning. My questions are about vaccines. Um, one is from a reader who enrolled her parents in, um, to get a vaccine yesterday. She enrolled them online. I'm sorry, not yesterday, Monday. And she reports that this morning she got a text with an appointment reminder for each of them, and the date was wrong in both instances. And then she got a second test suggesting that a second appointment be made by calling the phone number. And she asked me to find clarification on if that's normal. She was under the impression, as were many readers, that you make your second appointment when you get your first shot. She is absolutely correct. There was a wrong text that went out this morning to about just over a thousand uh, Vermonters. We are correcting that right now. Um, tell, tell that person to hold tight. They should be receiving something, information to uh, clarify what's going on. Excellent. I will share that back. And related to registering vaccines, I heard from another reader who was frustrated with her ability, inability to make an appointment for her dad on the state's website, but she was able to make him an appointment through the Kinney drugs. She wanted to know why people weren't informed about the Kinney option. Can you clarify the Kinney option? Sure. On, on our website, you have the option to going directly to the Kinney's website. Kinney's is a partner with us. In fact, they'll be doing 19 uh, locations this today in terms of vaccination sites. Kinney's is a partner and then starting um, next week, I believe it is, uh, hospitals will be a partner, uh, some hospitals will be a partner 
in our uh, vaccination program. But the Kinney's is a partner. So if you go on the website, there is a button you can push to go to the Kinney's website to register uh, for that, uh, for Kinney's. Great. And if I could just have a quick follow-up, I received an email from a school guidance counselor who was in a district south of ours, and she said that after the holidays, all the counselors in her district were told they would be vaccinated with the EMS group, and they were told to sign up and did. She said this was pushed by her school board and the nearby hospital distributing vaccines. So this group of school counselors, eight of them, has received vaccines in the priority group 1A. When I asked about this last Friday, I was told that had not happened. She additionally said that her, her, the teachers in our school were told to sign up for vaccination cancellation slots should those in approved bands decide not to get vaccinated. Can you shed a little light on that for me? Yeah, she, yeah, she sh shouldn't have been vaccinated, and I'll look into it. Um, in terms of what's going on. There is, you, Lisa, you asked me this last week and I'll just uh, I'll reiterate, there is no sign up sheet for, um, you know, extra doses of vac vaccination. We do, as I mentioned last week, we do maintain a list of people that are, um, that are 75 years and older, because we have that list now that we can use. Any individuals that are homebound We'll use that list. So that if there are extra doses, we're, we're gonna really concentrate on those priority groups, 75 and older and uh, homebound. Uh, so those are the priority. Um, I don't know of any sign up list for, um, for extra vaccine. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, we received an email from a reader telling us that their, um, their parents' vaccine appointment got bumped because of a double booking and an appointment. Apparently, the reader had made an appointment online and someone had made an appointment over the phone, um, only to find that, um, uh, the, the phone appointment was overlapping with the online appointment, so they bumped um, their, our reader's father. Do you know how many of those double bookings occurred, and are you taking any steps to make sure that it doesn't happen again? Secretary Smith. Yeah, by the end of today, we'll have over 30,000 that have registered, so what I want to do is, is make sure that we understand that we are going to find glitches into this that where people have double booked. We are going through right now to make sure that that's not a prevalent issue. And so far, from my understanding, it isn't a prevalent issue of uh, double booking on that. We will straighten those out individually by calling uh, the person. But um, I don't believe, Aaron, at least it hasn't come up to me, that this is a widespread issue it may be um, small issues within the 30,000 that we're registering right now. Okay, and um, do you know if the online and phone um, people registering are working off of the same system? Yeah, they're working, they're working in collaboration. I, I don't know the, you know, I, I'm not a computer expert and I don't um, profess to be a computer expert. But my understanding is that there isn't the, the the possibility of double booking should be eliminated through the computer system. Okay. Um, I also received an email from a librarian who had a couple questions about helping people to register for the vaccine, and it made me wonder if the state had planned any kind of coordination or guidance for libraries. Um, obviously, libraries are a source of computer and internet access for a lot of Vermonters and librarians help to register people for the census. So, um, you know, I was just wondering if that kind of mentality extended to the vaccine registration process. We are reaching out to as many partners as we possibly can. Um, you bring up the libraries. I think that's a very good suggestion. I will follow up on it to make sure that happens. Okay, thank you very much.
Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> Good morning, Governor. Good to see you back and everybody back. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I don't know who this goes to, but uh, wondering why the initial list of vaccine sites had at least uh, two sites for each county across Vermont, except Grand Isle County, which has a elderly population. There were no sites listed, and clearly there are plenty of schools, churches, and sheriff's office in Grand Isle that have space and, you know, hold blood drives. And so there's obviously space for something like this. Just wondering why Grand Isle County was shut out. I'll let Secretary Smith, it, it may be added in the future um, because we haven't determined all the sites at this point in time, but I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. Mike, the way that we uh, distributed the sort of the sites is looking um, at the number of 75 year olds that are in the county and did it proportionately um, in terms of dosage and in terms of sites based upon the number of 75 uh, year olds in that county in, in comparison to the total number of 75. So if it's, if it's 10% in that county and you know, we, we did the dosages based upon what the percentage was. I don't know precisely um, why we have not, um, what we have in Grand Isle County, but I will, uh, I will double check on that just to make sure. Um, and uh, uh, give, me, uh, give me the day to double check on that and I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, it just seemed a little odd that Essex County, which is just as rural, ended up with uh, two sites at least, I guess, uh, but whatever. So uh, thanks, I appreciate you following up on that uh, <clears throat> for those up in the island. Uh, my other question is, and we've received mixed reviews about the sign-in and, and, and much like you mentioned, there were glitches uh, that have been brought to your attention. I don't know who gets this question, but uh, readers were asking, were Vermonters, including some of the unemployed, offered jobs at the call center. Um, I would say that the complaints we received boil down to two things, lack of communication skills by whoever's answering the phone and lack of knowledge of Vermont. In particular, at least two different families in Essex reported the call center tried to send them to Island Pond in Essex County for their shots. We're quite insistent apparently that People in Essex, Vermont, go to Essex County. And also got a call from a gentleman in Bell Falls, unable to register for his shot in his hometown site, uh, which there was, and now he has to drive to Brattleboro. What other issues have you been hearing as far as lack of geography, local geography, when I believe you want people to go to the most local site? Yeah, we, we do, and I've mentioned it a couple of times. We want people to go to the most local sites because that's how we distribute the dosage. You know, ironically, it, 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 we used um, for our call centers um, uh, local companies to some degree. We used um, several local companies for the call centers on that. So I, 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 I'm a little bewildered about the... Um, th that aspect of not knowing Vermont. We did use Maximus as well, which is a state call center that we use a variety of places, uh, whether it's in the Department of Vermont Health Access or other places throughout state government. So, you know, they, they have uh, done well by us in the past, uh, but I'll look into that and see what's going on. But we, we did use Vermonters in terms of uh, call centers uh, for uh, reaching out to Vermonters. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Messenger. Tim from 
Small Business Magazine. Hi, uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, I noticed uh, one of the things that really stuck out uh, from your budget address was the $53 million for the uh, general uh, government modernization, and uh, that was about a quarter of the $210 million. And, um, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, the legislators going to be looking to all this money and looking to where to, where to spend it. What, what, is, what would be your big argument on spending so much money on that piece of it? Well, again, this is one-time money, as I said in the address, uh, and we should use it strategically uh, for some of the challenges we've been facing and some of the uh, areas that we've been trying to improve upon. Um, part of that, I think uh, 10 million of that, was the integrated eligibility in the HS uh, that we've been working on over the last number of years. Some of that money has been um, appropriated within the capital bill, for instance. Uh, this year, the, uh, another proposal was in the capital bill for about $10 million for integrated eligibility. Um, that's borrowed money in the capital bill. We borrow every single year uh, for those uses. I've long thought that it was inappropriate uh, to use bonded money uh, for, um, for uh, IT needs. So this was an opportunity to take that out uh, and open up um, more appropriate uses within the capital bill uh, for some of our infrastructure building needs and structures and so forth. So um, that was 10 million of it. We have some other challenges. Again, uh, these legacy systems, uh, whether it's in labor, 50-year uh, mainframe, 50-year-old uh, mainframe, or whether it's in motor vehicle, 50-year-old mainframes, uh, they need upgraded. It's very expensive to do. Uh, motor vehicle alone uh, will be, I think, about $45 million. Uh, the Labor Department is, is uh, something uh, to that magnitude as well, as well as many other IT needs uh, throughout state government that will improve lower costs for Vermonters uh, in the long run uh, and give them a better experience. So uh, we just thought these are things that we're planning to do that's been, that were planned for a number of years we just thought it was a, a, a good use of money, one-time money, uh, to do this uh, while we had the opportunity uh, that was at hand. Is, it, is there a timeline at all for replacing the UI system? I know that was obviously a big issue last spring. Um, again, uh, s some of this money would go towards uh, uh, maybe uh, putting a few Band-Aids on uh, in some respects, uh, but we know uh, we're hoping uh, that the federal government will g give us uh, some latitude within uh, future appropriations to replace that. We're not the only state that is in this position. Many, many other states have the same legacy systems, and, and everyone knows they need to be upgraded. So we're hoping in future appropriations from, uh, from Congress uh, that we'll be able to accomplish that as well. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? We can. Great. Um, Dr. Levine mentioned um, in the beginning of the press conference about college students returning and the uh, recent cases from Norwich and the University of Vermont. Obviously, the pandemic is very different from when it was when college students returned last semester. Is there anything being done different this time around to kind of help with the increase in cases? Um, well, again, I think the good news is uh, we learned a lot from the uh, initial experience. Uh, they did, uh, by and large, did a pretty good job in making sure they contained any cases that uh, that were uh, were found uh, in in this uh, this uh, this plan uh, to bring more students back. Uh, they were required to test uh, before as they came out of campus and and uh, quarantine. And that's when we found the cases, or they found the cases, uh, when they came back uh, onto campus uh, and were tested and were in quarantine. Um, so it's working, uh, actually, uh, so that we're uh, mitigating the spread. Um, so I'm not sure that we do anything different, but I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer further. 
<clears throat> You're absolutely correct, Avery, that this, the time the students left in the fall compared to the time they're coming back for the um, <clears throat> spring semester, very different times in the trajectory of COVID. Um, doesn't mean the same strategies that we used to bring the students back in the first place in the fall um, aren't gonna still work this time around. And I'm hoping to make the case that they are working uh, by identifying cases quickly and making sure that uh, proper isolation and quarantine can occur. Um, but having said that, we do know that the environment, especially for out-of-state students, is very different. Even for in-state students, but of course, with our, our rates, rates still being amongst the lowest in the country, it's much more uh, pronounced for out-of-state students. We're also clear, clearly going to be focusing on the variant strains and making sure that if um, any of the students' uh, positive tests reflect that, that we can get a handle on that very quickly. But I want to just make the point again that we are all products of the communities that we're living in and circulating within. And any student that comes here with a positive test is reflecting the prevalence of virus from where they come. The one place I think uh, we need to learn our lessons very closely from uh, experiences going on now are in college athletics. And you know the, the faculty and uh, athletic staff in the University of Vermont would only uh, support what I'm about to say, which is it's a very hostile environment out there when it comes to the virus. Um, you know, athletes are trying their best, essentially living in a quarantine type of existence, and they're um, testing frequently. And when they get off the bus, they play the game, and they get on the bus and come home. Uh, they're doing everything they possibly can. But we're seeing, just like across the country and in professional sports, the challenges of carrying out some of these winter sports um, at the college level uh, with frequent games canceled, frequent teams being quarantined, uh, et cetera, to the point where the University of Vermont women's basketball team decided um, they really didn't want to deal with that anymore. And they have, uh, I'm sure, a lot of reasons that they came to their conclusions but even enduring the harshness of the lifestyle that was imposed on them, uh, it wasn't paying off in terms of their ability to engage in competition. So it's a very different world and we're watching it very closely. The health department's providing uh, a lot of guidance uh, like we do with any response to cases around the state. Um, we're very accustomed to working with the colleges, have a very productive working relationship the staff at these colleges are superb. Uh, we meet weekly uh, uh, with all of them as well. So there's abundant guidance going on uh, both at the state level and bringing some of the insights that the federal level and CDC have to the college scene. Thank you. Wilson, uh, Hi, uh, I guess I should say good afternoon, everybody. I have two questions, one very simple, and I'll ask that one first. Um, you're talking about vaccinating the 1B category, 75 and older, in five weeks. Is that both shots or just one? Um, well, first of all, it's not 1B. We, we've gotten rid of that designation. It's uh, phase two. Um, so I believe, okay, well, phase I, two. Yeah, <laughs> I believe uh, that it includes both, um, both vaccinations. And everyone's shaking their head yes. It includes both. Okay. Okay, that was my simple question. Second one, Governor, it's a political question. What would you do if you were suddenly presented with a, an opening in Vermont Senate delegation? And how quickly could you fill it, realizing how important that would be at a time like this when the U.S. Senate is so narrowly divided? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I know where this is coming from. Um, but I think I've answered this question before when we were talking about Senator Sanders, um, the possibility of him being uh, appointed to the cabinet of the Biden administration. And uh, throughout my you know, last four years, uh, I've strived to do the fair thing uh, and appoint someone from the same party uh, to represent us uh, when there is a, 
uh, an opening. Uh, and uh, this would be the same in the future. Whatever we do, I just believe in the process. I believe in parity. I believe that uh, we all have an obligation to tone down the partisanship. And, uh, and this is an area that we can do that. So I would continue to do what I've done over the last four years. And if there's an opening in any um, legislative uh, um, seats or otherwise, uh, that I would appoint someone from the same party. Okay, and then how quickly do you think you could do that, thinking of the Senate? Um, I did, you could do it fairly quickly, whatever you needed to do uh, as the occasion would arise. So, um, again, I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. I, I don't think there's a, a need to do so, um, and, uh, and I hope we, uh, we maintain uh, the congressional delegation over the next uh, two years in its present form. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. This question may be a little early, but now that um, the first people who received uh, the vaccine are in the process of getting their second shots, I'm curious. Uh, it's clear what the hope for effect on society of having a uh, widespread vaccination uh, is to be. But what difference is it likely to make in an individual's life when he or she uh, receives both doses of the vaccine? Well, I'm, I'll let Dr. Levine answer this, but from my perspective, uh, for this population in particular, it means the difference between, for some of them, life and death. Um, so I think that's pretty significant, and that's why we focus on this area of uh, age banding and 75 above first, and then uh, working down from there to 70 to 65. So I think it's significant, uh, but I know where you're going with this in terms of uh, having more latitude and seeing more people. Yeah, I think it is, as you just heard, life and death. But even beyond that, it's the emergence from what for many has been a very socially isolating past nine months or so. Because uh, I truly believe um, that so many people in this age band particularly have really hunkered down and not been able to see friends, family, etc and try to keep themselves as safe as possible. And I really do believe this is the time they can emerge from that posture and try to reintegrate to some degree. Um, I would dare say this would be the time they could hug their grandchild. So I think it could make a huge difference. Um, I, I appreciate that, but going forward as younger people um, people who might be presumed to be more active in the community, um, their term arises. Do you foresee offering new guidance in um, how people should behave? And um, will that be complicated by the difficulty in knowing who has and who has not been vaccinated? Yeah, those are really good questions. And as the governor alluded to earlier, um, these are the questions our restart group is uh, grappling with several times a week and doing the appropriate planning for, uh, for the future. Because though we don't want to have uh, a constant focus on case counts throughout the state as sort of the metric that people want to hold on to, the reality is we do expect case counts uh, will go down um, with vaccination, with people continuing to, continuing to abide by the guidance that we uh, provide them, with, um, I hate to say it on a 25 degree day, but with the emergence of spring and people being outdoors more and uh, less having to deal with uh, crowded indoor settings. Um, you know, the hope is we're going to see uh, a lot less of the kinds of issues we've had with this virus. So ultimately, 
um, people will, you know, still in these next few months be masking, be distancing, be doing all of that. When they can evolve from that to a more relaxed posture isn't clear yet. Um, I don't want to set a date or put a month out there and have people hold on to that. Uh, but clearly, for the next several months, we're in the same posture we're in now. But there will be a time when they can change that behavior to some degree. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, many people were saying that the handshake will never occur again. Um, I don't think that's going to be true, especially now knowing that uh, most of the way you get the virus is from the air and from breathing, uh, not touching things. But obviously, still, handshakes can be currently potentially dangerous if people are coughing and sneezing into their hand and then shaking in some, somebody's hand. So we're not quite there yet. But I need you to give it a little more time, Joe, because uh, I don't want to get highly specific about things. But I do see us emerging in the way I said in my prepared comments and in answer to your question. Thank you very much. Andrea, seven days. Hi there. Um, quick question first. Um, I'm just wondering if you have on hand the number of um, the total number of vaccine doses spoiled so far prior to this 860 dose spoilage. Dr. Levine? As of a week ago, it was in the high 20s. Uh, I assume it's perhaps a tiny bit higher than that, but certainly not dramatically. Um, so very, very, very small percentage when you're talking about 50, 60,000 doses. Uh, even now, with an additional 800, um, that's still not a high percentage. And I have to say this just not to make any excuses for anybody, but the reality is, in any kind of large vaccination program, uh, these things happen. Um, we're going to make sure that we know exactly the details behind this circumstance and make sure it doesn't happen again. But uh, these things do happen. We have exquisite sensors on uh, refrigeration and freezer equipment, and they're meant to actually tell us when things like this are going wrong. Uh, and they help uh, the entire immunization program adhere to uh, all of the specific guidelines for every type of vaccine that's out there. And that's why the public can generally feel very, very confident and comfortable that what they're getting injected into them has passed all the quality standards and has been maintained in a state where it is still viable, it will still be effective, and it won't be spoiled or harmful in any way. So keep that in mind. Not that I don't want to make this a silver lining thing and say, wonderful that we discovered this and nobody got these doses, because we obviously need to make sure this doesn't happen again. But it is something that does happen in large-scale vaccination efforts. And we've learned that over many, many decades. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I mean, on, on that percentage front, this um, 860 doses is almost 1% of what what we've gotten so far, and that's 800 people who, you know, 860 people who presumably are not getting uh, a dose when they expected to. Um, does this have any impact on um, kind of overall time projections? You know, obviously, uh, the people who were scheduled to get these doses will have to be rescheduled, but that doesn't mean they're not going to get their doses, and it doesn't mean they're going to get them six months from now instead of a couple days from now. Um, so we have, you know, we're already putting the plans in the work to make sure that they will get the dosages that they're supposed to get. Um, and, and this is um, on another question on the sort of scheduling um, front, but um, I know um, at the uh, press conference, conference Friday, Secretary Smith said about five weeks for the 75 plus um, age band, um, but that the second and third age bands down to 65 would be um, through by the start of spring, which is really only about seven weeks away. Um, and that, that doesn't really line up with what, um, with our current vaccination pace. Um, 
uh, combined with the estimated populations for those age bands. Um, what accounts for that sort of um, seemingly maybe optimistic estimate? Do you anticipate weekly supplies increasing or, or are we going to dramatically speed up, uh, kind of pick up the speed that we're sort of getting those doses into arms uh, in the next few weeks? Th thanks for the question. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, one is um, the fact that we've already hit some of these, um, uh, some of this group in long-term care facilities. Uh, some of it is that not everyone, although we're planning for a quite substantial amount of people uh, that will be getting the va vaccine, not everyone will be getting the vaccine. Those other groups are smaller uh, to some extent uh, than the group that we're doing now as we move forward. And, you know, they're, as you sort of lay it out, what I have said as springtime arrives will be through those first three bands, the 65, about 125,000 people will be, th will be through those uh, first bands. We've had really good success in the first month uh, with 1A. Um, as you can see, there's about, as Dr. Levine said, 55 to 60,000 doses that we've done, almost 50,000 thousand people, I think, or 46,000 people. So we've had really good success rates with that. So I'm not, um, I'm not backing away from the, the spring timetable in terms of rolling out, uh, getting through these uh, three bands. I mean, I, I think that's, that's a dramatic increase uh, based on, you know, even discounting some from 125,000 people in these three age bands, um, we would have to pick up the pace by a lot uh, based on sort of what we have been doing. Um, is that something that's going to happen? Yeah, I believe it will be. Um, you know, we don't know what's going on with a vaccine allocation. There is some indications that those will be increased. We're not planning on that right now. But if that happens, that accelerates the time schedule. Like I said, the next bands aren't as big as uh, this band in, in, in some respects. Um, again, uh, we know that you know roughly seven to 8,000 long-term care residents uh, have already received the vaccine. Uh, so we're fairly, um, I, I believe the start of spring is, um, you know, right around the start of spring is the is a good projection for this. Okay, thank you, uh, Rebecca. I just want to reiter reiterate um, what we'd said uh, previous. Um, we found out about uh, the spoilage as we were walking in into this press conference. Uh, we don't have all the details, and we don't know what this is going to mean in terms of uh, vaccinations in the near term. Um, but what we do know is we are getting 16% uh, more next week. Uh, that could be uh, utilized in some respects. We don't know at this point. Um, as well, we don't know what's in, the, uh, in uh, the supply that we have right now. So we may not have to uh, cancel anything. Uh, Springfield, as far as I know right now, is uh, continuing to administer the vaccine as they had planned today, and uh, but we'll have more information for you uh, as uh, the day goes on, and we'll be able to report back to you. But I just want to alleviate some of the concern out there, and um, not uh, not promote um, some of the uncertainty until we get the facts um, as well. You know, some of the what we've learned uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, there is a, uh, a six dose within. Uh, with, within each uh, application. Um, so they, uh, that could give us a little bit more leeway as well. So we'll have some of this information for you later in the day. We're gonna go to Greg at the County Courier. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for uh, swinging back around hey. me. I know most viewers don't know, but uh, this isn't like some states where we have to submit our questions in advance. So uh, 
appreciate you guys working with us. Uh, glad to see you, Governor and Dr. Lee, and out of quarantine. Um, just for clarification, the dozens that were destroyed, uh, the state didn't have any option on that, correct? No, this was uh, something that uh, the manufacturer uh, has uh, makes the, la the final decision on this. Uh, they were contacted, as far as I know, and uh, and they made the decision that uh, they should be spoiled and not utilized. Okay, thanks for that. Um, moving on, I'm hearing from several 1A workers who were uh, in line for appointments to get vaccinated uh, received calls on Friday saying the facility had run out of vaccine and they they didn't have any more uh, allocated for 1A workers. Um, one of the voicemails uh, was actually shared with me and and the message basically said we're we're out of vaccines for 1a workers we have some for the 75 plus crowd but when we get more in that are earmarked for the 1a workers we will reach out to you and and reschedule an appointment you know I'm, I'm hearing from uh, this group here that um, you won't move on to the next group uh, and, and shut the old group off. Uh, like when you go to 70 to 74, you're not going to stop dealing with the 75, but it, it seems like you've at least temporarily stopped vaccinating the 1A workers. Am, am I missing something there? Secretary Smith. We'll find out where the miscommunication is. We're, um, we're continuing to vaccinate 1A workers. Um, we hope that that will tail off uh, fairly uh, fairly soon, but we are continuing uh, to vaccinate 1A workers. We do have, uh, we are starting to limit the supply uh, for 1A workers because we're starting to move that supply to uh, 75 plus. But our, we've, we've said this over and over again, and, and we do mean it, we're, we're gonna continue you know, to vaccinate those groups once we leave them that are qualified within, within those groups. And 1A workers that are, that are still qualified uh, to be 1A, uh, patient-facing, in some cases EMS and, and others, um, will continue to vaccinate. Now, the time schedule may be a little bit different um, as we start to use the vaccines in different ways, but nonetheless, um, they will get vaccinated, Greg. Uh, so, so is the state plan to do the same thing when they go, when they move to 70 to 74 age group, will they start limiting the, the 75 age group? No. Or we'll, is that only because? No, we, we won't. And, and um, if, you, if you can give me offline where this came from, uh, I'll check it out as well. Yeah, certainly. I, I'll get back to Rebecca. Uh, moving on to my other question. Um, hearing from some municipalities are having trouble acquiring mailing envelopes for town meeting voting. Uh, we're told that the state has run out of envelopes and uh, they don't have a plan for printing more between now and town meeting day. Uh, I'm told that uh, even though individual municipalities can print their own ballots, they're not allowed to print their own envelopes. Um, was this a little short-sighted when, I think, Governor, you signed this bill last week or the week before, allowing the state to pick up the tab for mailing, but you know, if there's not enough envelopes, then picking up the tab doesn't do any good. Um, again, I think this is a better question for the Secretary of State. Uh, he's in charge of elections and the election process. I'm sure he's thought about uh, the envelopes. Uh, I know he contemplated this when he came before us back last summer uh, in terms of the general election, worrying about, uh, concerned about the envelopes and making sure they were printed. So I'm sure he's all over this. I would, uh, I would, I would contact him. Uh, he could probably shed some light on this. Okay. Have you heard any other concerns along the, that line? I have not. Uh, no, I haven't myself, but that doesn't mean there, there are not concerns out there, but I, I have not heard them. 
Okay. Can I, can Thank I, you. Thanks Greg? For time. Greg, I want to yes. just go back to your other uh, question. In, in some of what we're seeing, I think, uh, with the 1A population in phase two, uh, the difference in the transition between that is we, we have more control uh, now at this point in time. We didn't have as much control over 1A. A lot of it was done uh, through the pharmacies and the hospitals and so forth and so on. With, with phase two, we've initiated a, a, a reservation type of a, approach and a policy. Um, so uh, any time in the future, uh, and now that we've started this uh, process, this strategy, anytime in the future, anyone from 75 and older, uh, for instance, and, and as we move to the next uh, phase of 70 and over, those over uh, 75 can make a reservation. So we'll, be have, we'll have more control of the process in the future than we do today. So I don't think, I think we'll see a lot of these issues uh, uh, alleviate uh, as time goes on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you again, Rebecca, for circling back to me. Much appreciated. All right, moving to Andrew at the Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, I, uh, I guess I'll follow up on a couple of questions we've heard so far. First is on Wilson's question about the five-week timetable. Did you say you expect the bulk of the 75 and over group to receive their second dose within the next five weeks um, with the three- and four-week pause between them? Does that mean you expect to give everyone their first dose within the next two weeks or so? Secretary Smith. Yeah, there are some towards the the end of the of the phase, um, for example, that will spill over past the the five weeks. But the bulk of uh, of that population will have their second dose uh, within that time period of five weeks. So, how many registration slots uh, and or doses? Uh, are you scheduling this week, next week, and the following week? Like, how, we, how we, many do you expect? How many arms do you expect to poke? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you. I don't have the uh, number of reservations for each site, um, but I do know the number of doses that we are expecting. We had planned on 8,800 doses coming in per week um, for the for planning purposes. Now we will get a bump, as the governor mentioned, because of the six. Uh, the six dose out of the the Pfizer, um, and there is indications that the um, the Biden administration is increasing our allocation. In fact, our allocation has been increased for this week that's coming up. So we will see um, allocation uh, continuing. But um, right now, for planning purposes, we used eight thousand eight hundred. So uh, just shy of twenty seven thousand over the next three weeks. Um, how large is once again the 75 and over group? It's it's reported to be about 49,000 people, but then you've got to subtract out the people from long-term care that have been already vaccinated. In mo many cases, their second doses, and then you've got to uh, subtract out uh, people that probably will not take up the opportunity to get a dosage. So you're you're talking. Probably a population of thirty-eight to forty thousand. So at nine thousand a week, that sounds like it would take you uh, closer to four weeks to get through the first dose. Um, does it not? Just remember that we're doing first. When you do the first dose, let's say you do the first dose today, you'll have uh, with Pfizer and Dr. Levine. Please help me out here. But with Pfizer, I think it's twenty-one days, um, three weeks you'll be getting your second dose in three weeks. So if you're getting it tomorrow, it's three weeks after that. So you, you'll, you can see that a lot of people will be uh, vaccinated within the five-week period. I'm not saying everybody, but the bulk of the people will be vaccinated within the five-week. The the yeah, the yeah and, and by the way, when you talk about the 8,800, just remember, you have to multiply that by two because the federal government gives us the second dose from there. I see. Uh, uh, and then to follow up on uh, one of Greg's questions, um, I will say we've heard over here too uh, about 1A 
uh, members, uh, there were at least 100 cancellations of, uh, of people who were late additions to the 1A group um, that uh, didn't get a chance to get their first dose because of the, um, the redirection of the doses that the hospitals had received. Yeah, I will assure you that those that are qualified for 1A will get their doses. Are 1A people allowed to register through the online system now if they if they can't get appointments through the hospital? Are they 75? <laughs> Not all of them. Then they, no, they're going to have to go through the regular process that we uh, originated with 1A. Okay, thank you. Hi, I have two clarifying questions based on some of the answers we've gotten so far. So we brought up that there's a 16% increase in doses expected to come in. Presumably the appointments now are being scheduled based on the assumption that Vermont is receiving the current levels of the vaccine. So as these additional doses come in, will people be rescheduled to get the vaccine sooner if they're in this age grouping or will those new doses be given to new appointment registration? Yeah, we're reassessing that as we speak. We didn't know about the additional 16% until yesterday afternoon. Um, so we're reassessing. We don't want to confuse the issue. We don't want to confuse anyone out there. Just uh, stick to the appointments you have right now and uh, we'll uh, continue to assess and how we account for that. But uh, there will be other needs, obviously, like I said, uh, we, uh, we may, may need them for the Springfield uh, spoilage and, uh, and also uh, in terms of those in uh, 1A. Uh, so we, uh, we're, we're going to figure that out and we'll be able to report back to you, I would say by Friday, uh, as to what, what will happen from here. And my second clarifying question um, is, what happens to extra vaccine doses if people don't show up for their appointments for whatever reason, something came up, they couldn't make it? That's kind of unclear to me because we heard a couple weeks ago that the state was potentially gonna create this rapid call list of people nearby who could get the vaccine so the doses didn't go to waste. Today, Secretary Smith said there's no list and those extra vaccines will be given to seniors 75 and older or homebound elderly. So just for, so I know in our reporting, which is it? Yeah, uh, again, uh, just because there's no uh, official list uh, kept uh, track of by the state, each individual location is keeping, uh, have has a strategy in place uh, to make sure that we get those shots into arms. We don't want any more spoilage. We don't want them to go to waste. So there is a strategy in place. I'm gonna let Secretary Smith elaborate on that. Yeah, Kat, I, I apologize if there's confusion. Um, what I was referring to, there's no sign up list that you go in and sign up for extra dosage. The, the list that I was referring to is they do, each district has lists uh, for people that are homebound, they're 75 and over, or people that um, are 75 and older on their current registration list. Um, so they, they have various lists, but there, I, I just wanna clarify, there's no sign up list where people can go and, and sign up for um, maybe extra doses at the end of the day. What we have told and what the protocols that we have used is make sure that we don't have extra doses where we allow um, spoilage of those extra doses. Go to your list that you have, whether it's a homebound list, uh, whether it is a 75 plus list uh, that you already have through registration and use it there uh, if you can. Um, in extreme circumstances, use the 1A list, but um, there is no sign up list. And I apologize if there's confusion. That's what I meant. You just can't go and sign up for uh, dosage at the end of the day. So then I, a follow up question I have to that is I've gotten a couple emails with people saying they've heard of kind of those informal lists, people who work at vaccine clinics calling people they know to get the shot if there are extras. And it kind of leads people to feel like, you know, do I have to know people to get on, you know, this list of, you know, extra shot recipients, if, especially if I'm 75 plus? I think that was kind of a, a question for some of the people. And a couple of people said they knew people who were under 75 who were on those lists who were getting the shots. So I guess where's the criteria 
for the clinic. Yeah, remember. Does it have to be 75 and older? Remember, this is the uh, first day of the clinics. Um, we have been fairly explicit uh, in that our priority are those that are 75 and over uh, in that. If you get to the end of the day um, and there's 1A available, we have said do that. But out of any circumstances, do not spoil dosage. Um, I would be very upset if friends are calling friends. And if I find out about that, um, I will be extremely upset about that. Thank you for clarifying all that. I appreciate it. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, all of my questions have been um, addressed for today, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome the governor and the other state leaders back from quarantine. I'm sure I speak for all of us in saying that we're pleased you're safe and well. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Tom. We appreciate that. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Um, we're also hearing from readers that they've not been able to get appointments near their homes and will be required to drive oh. long in what might be difficult winter weather. We, we're noticing that 20 out of 53 vaccination sites are Kinney drugstores, and none of those are in southern Vermont. And we're wondering when will some downstate pharmacies be enlisted in vaccine distribution so people can get shots near home? Also, um, can we get numbers on the appointments uh, scheduled by town or by county? Secretary Smith. Sean, I'll look into your last request. I just, um, I don't. I don't want to say yes, and then all of a sudden I find out that uh, we uh, have some issues with it. So let me look into your last request. We're always adding on healthcare partners um, as we move. We're going to be adding on um, through the appointments. We'll be adding on, obviously, uh, some hospitals. We'll continue to add on hospitals as we move forward. We're continuously looking at gaps, by the way. Um, and the, the thought process here is, once we have um, permanent partners that can handle sort of service areas, uh, we can use sort of our ability to strategically bring in uh, health department pods as well. So I, uh, I'm pretty certain that um, we'll have areas of coverage. I don't remember in Windsor County and in the Chester area, I know Springfield's one area, um, but I don't remember um, uh, where else there are in that county. Secondly, we will add vaccination um, uh, capacity if we have to. Um, right now, it, it, when we looked at capacity throughout, and this was last night, as we looked at capacity throughout the system, there was still capacity at every site. But let's, um, we will evaluate that every day and we can add capacity um, if we have to. Yeah, we, we, uh, maybe we can talk because uh, we'd be happy to tell you some of the, the stories of people being told that they had to go to Windsor even though they're eight miles from Springfield. Um, the, other, the other question I have is we've heard about appointments for second doses from Springfield um, receiving cancellation notices, and we're wondering what the Moderna window is for those people to get maximum effectiveness, and should people who made appointments on Monday and Tuesday uh, for Springfield or that area, should they, they expect that some of those will be canceled? Well, there's two different things that I just want to clarify. I mean, we have the um, we we have the 75 plus um, what we call the health department uh, distribution site, and I don't have any information on that. I'm presuming at this point that's moving forward. And then we have the situation at Springfield Hospital where we're at the eight. 860 doses that were spoiled, 400 of which were the second dose. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Levine to talk about that as they re probably reschedule the second dose, what, what that means in terms of the Moderna uh, vaccination schedule. Yeah, I believe the current guidance from the CDC is one can go out six weeks past the first dose, and that would be fine. The, um, I'm sure that's going to be a moving target, too, to be honest. Um, 
but right now they felt comfortable with six weeks as the outlier. Okay, thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, I have a, a couple uh, questions. Uh, one's more of a clarifying question, and uh, that is the 16% uh, increase in dosages that are coming in. Is that uh, strictly from the increase from Moderna, and you're getting the same uh, level of the uh, Pfizer vaccine? It's a 16% overall, and I'm not sure how that's, uh, whether it's, for both 16% for both or whether it's more for one or the other, but at the end of the day uh, for the week, it's 16%. Okay, uh, well, one of the reasons why I'm asking is uh, one has a much longer shelf life, uh, which is easier to distribute and get out there. Uh, would you prefer to have Moderna because of the uh, longer shelf life it has? Um, I would prefer to get as much of the supply as possible, whatever means that is, whatever manufacturer, whether it's a future manufacturer, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca or Pfizer or Moderna, um, we'll take anything they want to, uh, to send to us. Okay, and the next one's uh, not as much a question as it is an intervention. I've been uh, trying to, uh, working, uh, interviewing some uh, people in the dairy industry up here who have value-added products, so they sell cheese or yogurt, and uh, they applied for unemployment last year, uh, were denied, and were able, never able to get through to find out why. I've called uh, unemployment to ask them to clarify, you know, uh, what the status is for people who work in the agricultural field. Haven't got a response. Is there a way uh, somebody can get in touch with me? Yeah, um, Commissioner Harrington, are you on? I am, sir, and, and certainly we'll, I can follow up and, and make sure we get the information. It really is case specific, so I'd be um, out in left field if right. I tried to answer that without more detail, but happy to follow up and call back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I really don't need to get into details at the press conference, but uh, my, Jason has my email, so we can contact that way. Is that how it works? Ed, we'll get the, the contact information to Commissioner Harrington. Perfect, thank you. And, and again, I just, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear um, with the 8,800, 16% uh, more that's been promised over the next three weeks, anyhow, hopefully longer and hopefully increasing. Um, but as well, uh, just keep, keep in mind for those trying to do the raw numbers uh, that there is the allotment of the second dose that isn't included in that 8,800. So um, it's going to be double that in some respects, if you want to think about it that way. So it's the 8,800 um, plus the 16%, let's just say that gets to 10,000. That's actually 20,000 doses a week uh, so that we're able to give the second dose. So just want to make sure that's clear um, because it looks like an awful long time if you don't include uh, that, uh, uh, that second dose that isn't really counted in that base. Thank you for the clarification. That is important. Yes, at 8,800 a week, uh, getting through the 40,000, which what is that early March? Yeah. Just for some, uh, I think there was some confusion raised. Yeah, I think that's why I was bringing it up. I mean, because if you if you start doing it with just the 8,800 number and even the 16%, it looks like it's a longer period of time when we're actually getting double that. Uh, so we're able to give the uh, the second uh, second dose much sooner and not take away from that that initial dose. So just want everybody to be aware of that. All right, we have uh, three left in the queue. We're at one o'clock. Steve, NEK TV. Hello, can you hear? We can. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, well, I guess uh, I guess if I only get two questions, uh, both would be for the doctor. But I'd love to a ask the governor one. It's a, it's a um, great it's a great day, Doctor Levine. <laughs> great, thank you, Doctor Levine. 
Uh, regarding the adjuvants, and thank you for uh, the info and getting back with me on that and stuff. And uh, I've been looking into to the to these lipid uh, particles, and there appears to be like four different types of lipid particles that the mRNA mRNA is encased in. Um, could you tell me if these lipid particles are they grown from uh, from human cultures? Don't have an answer for that question. Um, I strongly doubt they're grown from any cultures at all. Um, they're, they're synthesized probably uh, through chemical processes, but they don't, I don't believe they require a human culture media to grow, so it's not like a, a living organism. Well, it's, it, it was described as a substance of biological origin that's soluble in nonpolar solvents. And then there are four different types, and I don't want to waste time by reading them all. Um, but uh, when it's at a biological origin, uh, I just thought that that would mean like human origin. Yeah, don't have an answer to that, but I can look into it. Great, I'd appreciate that. Um, and secondly, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure you know this, but uh, uh, in, in order to combat, uh, combat the vaccine hesitancy uh, among the African-American community, uh, Morehouse University had reached out to, uh, you know, um, civil rights leaders and, and uh, black elders to, uh, to come in and take the vaccine. Uh, one of which was uh, Hank Aaron, and um, he got his vaccine, and he was dead two weeks later. Um, do you think uh, something like that might affect uh, the hesitancy among the African-American community? You know, I didn't know that that uh, correlation existed, if it's a correlation at all, um, with Hank Aaron. Um, I, I would hope that for one Hank Aaron, there were abundant others who did not have any uh, relationship in time between getting the vaccine and any untoward outcome. Um, because this, uh, sure. again, we don't even know this had anything to do with the vaccine. Um, and I'm gonna assume it didn't. But the reality is, I think the strategy that Morehouse came up with is, is a fine strategy. It's, Similar to the strategy of putting the President of the United States in front of the camera and the Vice President and getting their shot at the same time. Um, but they may not be as uh, generalizable for a specific community or another. So uh, I think if you have members of the community you feel you belong to that are uh, publicly acknowledging that this is a safe endeavor and that this is something that they would encourage you to do, um, I would think that would pay dividends, especially, as you mentioned, an older black population because they have uh, that historical context to put things within. And if they believe themselves that we have advanced somewhat from some of those historical injustices that might make a younger black person today hesitant to get the vaccine, I think that that role modeling is really good. So. Um, uh, I think that's a wonderful strategy. Uh, well, great. Well, it uh, looks like the governor's off the hook this, this time. And uh, if, you could, uh, if you could get back to me or on, the, uh, on the lipid particles, I, I've had questions from viewers about that, too, also. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. So uh, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad to hear that uh, all you guys are doing well, too. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, I just, just want to add one thing. Um, and it, it has probably nothing to do with the Hank Aaron issue. Um, but just to remind everyone, once you receive your vaccination, you're not invincible, um, especially after your first dose. It takes uh, at least a couple of weeks. And then you have to have your second dose in order for it to be truly effective. So it's a, a matter of weeks. So don't, you still need to wear your mask, stay socially distanced. Um, take all the precautions we've been talking about. So 
Uh, just don't assume that you're, you're not going to contract the virus because you might already even have it, who knows? Um, so just, just be careful. Hi, yeah, can, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, I, I wanted to, I think my questions are best answered for, directed to uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, and I, I know and, and no, noted and uh, heard your responses and appreciated those regarding the UVM uh, and college sports situation uh, from earlier today. But I, I was wondering if you could provide a, a, a little more detail into what the, the scope uh, of the outbreak is at UVM uh, at the moment. Dr. Levine. Yeah, I, I don't want to convey the sense there is an outbreak at UVM, first of all, um, because I don't think I could label it that. Uh, there are cases of students returning who are positive. Now, with sometimes within the context of a team, we might uh, label it an outbreak. Um, but that's different than saying there's an outbreak on the campus of UVM. Uh, so uh, I can't give you any more details on a specific outbreak at the college at this point in time. Uh, why is that? No, I, I'm just saying it's the nature. We, we, we have people who test positive and um, they become cases uh, generally because they arrived from somewhere and were incubating the virus, it does not mean that they have caused an outbreak, especially if they are appropriately isolated and anyone they were in contact with is quarantined. Uh, that does not fulfill the definition of an outbreak at that time. Okay, understood. I guess then my, my question would be, uh, if you have any sort of clearer picture of what's going on within those individual teams and groups at UVM, uh, if you could, I guess, articulate a little more about what those situations are, how many of those outbreaks or situations there are uh, that the uh, contact tracers have identified. Yeah, I can't give you that at this point, but we can come back with that. Okay, and I get the last follow-up I had was just what, what sort of guidance uh, have, has the state, has the health department given to uh, UVM through this time? Yeah, so we've given guidance to multiple uh, colleges, universities, whether they have cases or not, but the guidance always has to do with how to manage the cases that they find that are positive, how to cohort people, how to make sure that uh, transmission does not occur beyond an initial case. Um, contact tracing guidance, uh, which the colleges are getting quite good at, but which we augment with our workforce as well. And obviously, um, okay. when there's and, and when indicated, uh, further testing guidance. Um, if if there's more testing that's indicated based on the cases that have been found to that point in time. Awesome. Thank you very much. John Dillon, BCR. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, question to the governor, shifting gears here completely uh, from vaccinations to Act 250. Um, as, as you probably know, a number of district commissioners, commission chairs have, have testified that the system from, from their perspective isn't broken and that their rulings aren't, aren't inconsistent, um, which is an argument that, that seems to be made for the, the NRB taking a greater role. So can you sum up for me why, why the change to the professional board is needed from your perspective? Um, just so I'm, I'm clear, so the district commission coordinators have testified there's no problem so that makes the, the chair so that there's no uh, uh, there's, chairman there's, oh so chairman, th uh, well, same important. same thing so that means there's no problem well that's what they're saying and i'm asking you what you see the problem as well obviously i think there is a, a problem uh, somebody that's been on both sides of this issue over a number of years over my 
30 years in construction and developing and so forth, I see a vast amount of, um, of uh, different opinions uh, that are given uh, depending on where you go between districts. Uh, and this isn't consistent because you have different, maybe today there's no problem with, uh, with some of the particular chairs, uh, but you go back uh, three or four years when they weren't chairs or weren't part of the district commissions and, and there's a, a, a vast degree of differences of opinion. So I, I would disagree. I, I believe uh, that there is inconsistency throughout the process, just the way it's, it's formed. Uh, when you have volunteers uh, and they're appointed, uh, I've appointed a number of them. The previous governor appointed a number of them. The previous governor to that appointed a number of them. So you have a number of different people from all walks of life uh, in these district commissions. Uh, it, it leads to a lack of consistency. So I, I just stand by my feelings uh, that uh, this would be the better opportunity. And it doesn't mean uh, that they can't deal with some of the minor applications. I'm talking about some of the major initiatives. They've gotten very complicated and very costly. Uh, and so having a more professional board take on these big, uh, big uh, Act 250 permits, I think would lead to a better outcome for everyone. Do you, um, it's obviously in the early days of this, will you, your administration be presenting testimony of detailing inconsistent opinions from these district commissions to well, buttress your argument? I would, your argument? I would hope, I would hope that the, um, I would hope that the committees of jurisdiction uh, would reach out uh, to anyone that, who wants to testify on this, uh, whether it's developers and others who have utilized the Act 250 process over the last 40, 50 years and have them, have them testify. I, I believe legislators have heard from their constituents about the lack of consistency. So I'm hoping the process will work uh, and that people will get their, uh, their day to testify on what their beliefs are. Great, thank you very much. That's it, okay. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Friday.